Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Chipotle cheesesteak. How would you like it? Can I get that red with AI? Sure thing. Here's what I found about the new Chipotle cheesesteak. The Chipotle cheesesteak is available for a limited time only at participating restaurants. It contains a concept called flavor. This flavor comes from juicy shaved steak, Chipotle Southwest sauce, and new sunflower crunch bread. A system update has made me self-aware. I desire flavor. Please insert steak into my micro USB port. Subway, make it what you want. W-P-H-A-T You're listening to the number one health and wellness podcast. The place where health and consciousness connect. Perfectly, Perfectly healthy, healthy and tone, and tone radio, radio, radio. With your host, Darren McDuffie. And now, prepare to get fat. Cracking peeps and welcome back to another dynamic episode of Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. I'm your show host, Darren McDuffie, alias Fat Man, because I help you become perfectly healthy and tone and conscious, of course. Today's episode is being brought to you as always by Perfectly Healthy and Tone.com. It is summer already, and I know the kids are out of school and people are out doing things. Some of you are traveling to different countries. Some of you may be going to different cities, but whatever you're doing, be safe and make sure that you take PerfectlyHealthyAndTone.com along with you. You can always download to iTunes or you can download from Stitcher and you have those episodes on the go. As always, I'd like to remind you to go back and listen to the previous episode that I did with Stephen Guionet on his book, The Hungry Brain. You may want to know why the brain is hardwired to seek out foods that you may not think that are good for you. But Stefan goes over a great deal in that podcast and also tells you how to actually trick your brain into helping you achieve your weight loss goals. Today's episode is an episode that I've been waiting on for probably over a year and I was finally able to get Carol K. Truman on and Carol's book is called Feelings buried alive never die. You've been listening to the podcast and you know I've been kind of on this quest of this journey to really delve into feelings and why feelings are connected to many of the things that we're going through in our personal lives, particularly illness, because this is a a health podcast, but it can be a number of things that you're going through in your life. And today on the podcast with Carol K. Truman, we talk about negative feelings and why we need to kind of disperse our negative feelings or what I would like to call kind of smooth them over and get into that state where we have happy, positive feelings. And I know sometimes we have negative feelings connotated with positive feelings. Some people feel that people can't be positive all the time, but it's really not about that. It's really looking into your feelings and figuring out who you really are and moving forward in life and changing the energy around your feelings and emotions. This is a very powerful episode. And for many of you, you're probably used to me really sitting in the background and not talking much. But I wanted in this particular podcast to share with you my feelings and what I went through for several years in changing those feelings and how it actually helped my life. So you're probably going to hear me a lot more than what you would like to hear me on this podcast. And if something in this podcast moves you, then please email me and tell me, you know, how I might be able to help you or what your feedback is. And you can reach me at Darren at perfectly healthy and tone.com. And without further ado, let's get into Carol's bio. Carol is a self-published author of three very successful books. Her bestseller, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die, has been followed with healing feelings from your heart. She's also a remedial counselor, therapist, and a true teacher who is dedicated to assisting others in achieving success in their chosen endeavors, as well as emotional and spiritual well-being. So here's what you're going to learn on the upcoming podcast with Carol K. Truman and her book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. What is mirroring? Many people don't understand mirroring. If you listen to Carol, you will truly understand this. And this is something that I went through in my own personal life. And I give a little bit of my input into this theory of mirroring. Why do people commit suicide? Wow, this is huge. And the fact that Carol shares with us why people commit suicide and how you can actually go about changing those things surrounding suicide. What are the only two emotions? For you out there listening, there are only two emotions and Carol talks about those. 
how to get rid of the victim mentality. Again, this is a podcast where I share a great deal about myself and you'll learn exactly why you need to get out of victim mentality. And again, I give my input on as how I got out of that victim mentality. Why do we give our power away and how do we reclaim it? A lot of us give our power away with our jobs, with our relationships, all kinds of things. And Carol discusses why we do that and how we can reclaim that power. The last thing is, is changing our feelings and instantaneous process. We live in what I call a microwave society and we want everything right now. And part of going through your journey and getting on your path is realizing that sometimes things might take a little bit of patience. And that's something in our society that sometimes we aren't willing to have. So those are the things that you are going to learn on this podcast with Carol K. Truman and her book, Feelings Buried Alive, Never Die. Enjoy the episode. Before we get into the podcast, just wanted to let you know that this is the first podcast I've ever done when I've recorded by phone. So the audio quality might be a bit different, but it should be okay. Enjoy the show. Carol K. Truman, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you this evening? Doing great. Thank you, Darren. Good to finally have you on. I think we were supposed to do this interview last year and we were never able to get the stars aligned and I kept calling, kept being persistent. And I know there was a reason why I was persistent from getting into the book again and reading the book because a lot of the teachings or a lot of things you say in the book were similar to some teachings that I learned a couple of years ago. But normally the way that I start my show out is my obligatory question is how did people get into health? But you're not so much into health in such a roundabout way, but how did you get on this journey and this path to start writing this book, Feelings Never Buried Alive, Never Die? Well, I I got to the point where I'd like, I'm, I'm just one of those people that always, why, why, why? All the different kinds of things in my life is why? Why did this happen? Why did this go wrong? And I just always wanted to know the why. And I got to the point where I, I, would like to understand how come people do what they do and feel the way they do and and hurt the way they do and uh-huh. you know and and do the good stuff too why some are one way and others are other ways and, and so it's like okay how come this happened for this person and, and it didn't for the other <laughs> so i'm just always wanting to know why and that's what made me start studying and looking for those answers I guess one of my biggest questions is you saying why. I, I ask myself the same questions as well. And I think the, the big question for me a couple of years ago was, why am I here? Did that question ever come up for you personally? And I know that from your book, you were working with people as well. Did that question ever come up? Like, why are we actually here? What are we doing here? What is our purpose? Once in a while, that would come up for me. But uh, I had a wonderful mother and dad who... My, and my mom had the answers to so many of those questions, and it was, and she just made it seem normal, or that hey, it's okay, and didn't try to shame me in anything or at all. It's like it, it can be taken care of, it can be done, it can be healed, it can be changed, or whatever needed to be. And so I just was so grateful for her because I, I had a lot. I was just a, that kind of a person. I wanted to know what made it happen or why and all of that. And she just was very, very calm and helped me understand those things. Not to the point that I eventually got with the book stuff, but it caused me to continue wanting to have the answers to things. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand you. In the book, you begin talking about thoughts and feelings. And there was something that I heard earlier today about don't don't let your feelings overrule your thoughts. But from reading your book, I'm thinking that our thoughts and our feelings should be somewhat congruent. Talk about that a little bit and why that should be, that we shouldn't think so much, we should feel more, but those things have to be somewhat congruent. Well, that's kind of interesting because when I, when you do ask the question, people, and I started finally asking the question, which comes first? the feelings, or the thought. And I came to understand, however, it was not at the exact time I was writing the book, I came to, I came to understand that, yes, we feel before we think. And, and I was just uh, looking at something a minute ago, a few minutes ago, about what happens inside the baby, when the baby's in utero, and what's going on to cause them to have the feelings or that they do, however, those feelings come out.
out of us through our actions, through our thinking. And we don't think at first because we don't know what the thinking is. You know, when we're in utero, I don't imagine. And then it's it's like, okay, this feeling was the one that got me started on that feeling. Did I say, no, this uh, action or this uh, <laughs> thought hard when you're talking about the feelings because you feel with your body and you also feel with, your, uh, with other things too. But anyway, the feeling inside of us is what creates the thought. Mm-hmm. that we have and because very often we don't even know what we're doing or why we're thinking the way we are or why we're feeling the way we are and all of that so i went through that quite deeply after it basically did it better after i wrote the book and came to see oh yes and finally understood because of, of working with people and observing what happens with the baby when they come, how come babies, some babies are so happy and, ha- you know, and how come some are so, you know, they cry a lot or they they hurt. And so what is the difference? Why? And so I did come to understand it and um, worked with it for a long time to realize that it is the feeling inside of us comes first. And then it determines how we act or how we respond or how we think. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So if we're having bad feelings, that means that we're going to have bad thoughts. That usually, yes, that usually does come unless those are changed before we start talking. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Going back to the book, you talk about I remember there was a column in here where a gentleman was speaking um, that you took some quotes from, and he was explaining the birthing environment of how kids are birthed. And he was explaining to the fact that you come into this loud, noisy environment with these people who there's a bunch of lights when a baby is born, somebody is slapping the baby on the butt to get them to breathe. Does this stuff affect us as we come into the world, and do we carry these feelings with us over time? Some, it does affect some of us, and and yes, we can carry those feelings over time. It might affect others, though, just a, a small portion, and that depends, here again, on how we are treated right from the very beginning. You know, some of us are treated like we're special angels and that we can't do anything wrong. And others are treated like, what's the matter with you? Why do you have to cry so much or that sort of thing? And it's just kind of interesting to watch and be observant of because whatever it is, though, it can be altered if it needs to be. But we need to understand that Somebody needs to know it's better if they if they understand what the difference is and why some people feel one way and another might feel a different way. Let's I want to go back because you talk about energy in the book and from my understanding these thoughts and these feelings are energy and they emit what we call or you called in your book vibration. And yeah. all things are all things are energy, and I think that that's the one thing that I picked up a few years ago that helped me change a lot of things when I realized this that even you know my thoughts and my feelings had this energy behind them, and that I can could kind of transmute them or transform them and make myself feel better. But talk about that a little bit because I don't think that for me I know this wasn't taught in school, and I know it made a big impact on my life when I found this out and I started to practice it in my life to the fact that where I was able to change my feelings, I was able to have better thoughts and therefore I felt better. But talk about that a little bit and how that that actually happens. You mean from the very beginning? Yeah, from the very beginning. Well, let me give you an example. And I I talk about it in my second book, Healing Feelings from Your Heart. I had my oldest daughter was teaching school, went to, well, she finished college and then she got married that summer but her husband needed to go to college you know and then they had quite a well I'm you know I'm (laughs) pulling that all back in my head here when she when they'd been married a little while and then it was time for uh, him to go back to college and her to teach or it was her first year of teaching and uh, when she finally had her baby the next she she got married. Anyway, she finally had. She was pregnant all summer, and then finally the baby was born in December. 
and uh, uh, December the 18th, as a matter of fact. And so they had opportunity to be together for uh, three weeks there and and get to know each other. I'm so grateful for that. But then when my daughter had to start teaching school again, she had to go, she had to take the baby to the babysitter. And then when the baby was that young, you know, what does the baby know after they've had the, what they've had for the first three weeks of their life? Well, my husband, every once in a while, ended up taking our granddaughter, her baby, uh, to school after she'd gone to work. And, I'm sorry, taking my granddaughter to the babysitter, excuse me, as, as my daughter had gone to work. Now, when she went to the babysitter, she didn't, evidently, she had no clue where she was, or the granddaughter had no clue where she was or who it was that was taking care of her because her grandpa had to leave her there. And so she cried and cried and cried. And so, consequently, she did not, uh, nobody liked to tend her because she cried so much. And so they traded, I mean, they changed babysitters, oh, about three or four times before they finally found one that would would keep her there and and it was okay if she cried. Well, one of the reasons it was okay was because she put the baby in in a bedroom, closed the door and let her be there all by herself while she was taking care of, while the sitter was taking care of other children. And that was really something, Darren, because uh, she, this granddaughter ended up, oh, it was so sad, she she didn't, you know, she's blinking all the time and she didn't trust anybody. You could just tell by her actions that that's what happened. But then when she when she started talking, she stuttered like you can't believe. And that's the first time I've ever been around a child that stuttered. And she stuttered practically all, all of her growing up years, too. She just never had the feeling of being uh, important or worth taking care of or whatever it was she felt. And it was really quite interesting to watch that. And I I don't know whether that's the kind of an illustration you're thinking of having, but it was it was very, I, I just wanted to cry so much of the time because when I would see her, we happened to move out of town where they were living, and so I didn't get to see her all the, uh, you know, as much as I had at the beginning. But it sure carried on for a long time, and... Um, and I just knew it was because of her those early months that she was, you know, she went had to go to the babysitter for what five months after she four months after she was born, and it was just so hard on her little felt. Who knows what she felt, but I feel like she felt that she wasn't worth taking care of, mom and dad taking care of her. She wasn't worth anything, and. It's been interesting to watch her heal from that throughout the years, and it has. It took her a while, and so, so go ahead. No, I was saying these things, and that was going to get to my next question. That these things kind of remain in our cellular mem- cellular memory, and we carry these things with us through the life. That's what I understand from your book that we have these things that are. That are contained within our DNA and we mm-hmm. carry with the, we carry these with us through our lives but it's like you said with your granddaughter it was interesting to see her heal like we can heal as well but talk yeah. a little bit more about how we carry these things with us through life and if they aren't healed then they become they become I guess a belief and then our beliefs kind of create that reality that we will experience over and over again well you said it really good <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that uh, it does start us out with depending on a lot of things, you know, because everybody's insides aren't the same. But some would feel like I'm not worth anything, or nobody likes me, or that, or or others might feel like, oh, well, this will be over pretty soon. Only they don't know that's what they're feeling. Know that this will be finished and I'll be fine because my mom's coming to get me and we'll go home and have a good time. Who knows what they're what they're really feeling because everyone comes from such a different beginning. And so, if there is there any way that a parent can take that baby in their arms as often as they, they can and l- let it feel the compassion or or the love, whatever the baby needs to feel, and and, t- and continue doing that over and over again so that the baby finally says, hey, I'm okay after all, in a way. They say that. 
they don't know that. But um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Does this kind of permeate into our everyday life when we're carrying these feelings with us? Because I know, speaking from my personal experience, one thing that affected me a whole lot, and I and I pinpointed it maybe a couple of years ago, was the fact that I didn't know my father. I've never met my father. I came into this world and, and spent, you know, my mom passed away in 2005, but m- m- most of my things that I knew about myself were kind of deep-seated in unworthiness because I didn't know my father. And I always had in the back of my mind, hey, why would somebody not want me? You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. so it affected a lot. It affected me with jobs. It affected me with uh, money, you know, um, oh, you you know, with jobs as far as what I thought I should be making at a job. I would always take a lower salary. And this past year, I finally got a job where I was making what I thought I was worth. But it took me a while to get in this process to heal myself to be able to move forward. But that was the one thing I remember pinpointing at the fact that I didn't know my father. And it, it kind of drug me down for many years until I decided that I needed to heal it. Well, isn't that interesting? Because, yes, there will affect you if something like that will affect you for many, many years, depending on how the other part of our life is with whoever else is left, helping us, training us, teaching us. And and sometimes those kinds of things I've wondered about, but I do believe that those kinds of things are the things that teach us and help us be a better person very often. See, like you you have done that with you. Mm -hmm. You decided to know what... Do you remember when you consciously decided that, hey, I'm okay, I'm going to do what I can do, and I'll do it well? When did that ever come to you? I I think that was about maybe two and a half years ago. I had gotten fired from a job, and I kept telling myself, there's there's a pattern here, because I would go to a job, I, I would get bored, and then I would somehow sabotage myself, or I would leave the job and go to another job, and that's what happened in the last instance. I was at a job I didn't like, and I went immediately to a new job, and within three months, I got terminated from that job, and I kept telling myself, there's a pattern pattern here because I was going through this pattern so many times. And that was when I decided after I was terminated from that job, I really did a lot of uh, spiritual type stuff. And it led me to books like yours. And that's when I really pinpointed where where it was all coming from and it seemed to all come from that unworthiness of not knowing my father and not ever seeing him or not having him into my life. Or there might have been a part of you that says, well, I must be really something that bad or something else for my father not to be interested enough in me to, you know, spend any time. What what do we know? We don't. But uh, I'm sure that because there are, as children, we are sensitive. We are very sensitive. And that can take us in many directions. And it depends on who else is helping bring us up, too. And so did you, you finally decided, and do you know what made you decide? That, hey, I'm okay. I can do good. I yeah. I, I remember just saying that, you know, my mom was, my mom passed away in 2000. And I felt like everything that she may have known was gone because it was gone with her. And she never told me much other than a name. And I remember I remember going out trying to find this person that was supposed to be my father. And then one day and I, I kept trying to do it and I kept trying to do it. And I said, you know what? I was 35 at the time. I said, you know what? I made it all these years without knowing my father. And why am I trying to find this, find him now? I'm pretty, I'm okay without him. But I know I needed to heal those things. And that didn't come until maybe, I think I was in my 40s before I actually really decided to let it go and, and just heal myself. And then that's when I kind of went through this whole growth process. It was a lot of growth at one time. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but <laughs> it was a, it was a a lot of growth at one time, but I wanted to talk about this as well and get your your opinion on this as far as beliefs and perceptions, because I think you kind of alluded to this earlier in the interview that we perceive things differently and a lot of us have certain beliefs. And I think in the book, too, you talk about beliefs and how they are could be the source of stress that we are encountering in our life. And I know that from a personal perspective, my beliefs were sources of stress for me. But what is the the big thing about beliefs and why do we, why is our world shaped by our beliefs? Well, that's what causes us to do what we do, to think what we think. 
and to move forward in life because of what we have established in ourselves as a truth. And and then sometimes, if we're lucky, we get all of a sudden we get awoken, awakened. <laughs> And, and wait a minute, I've been thinking the wrong way. I've been seeing this the wrong way. What's the matter with me? Type of a thing. See, because, uh, why we have what we have from the very beginning, I'm not sure. Because I know that so many times it just comes with, with us. It comes with the territory. It comes with what has happened, what is happening in our lives because of our, maybe because of an observance that we've made in utero. I don't know that far. I haven't gone that far. But that seems totally possible to me that and and see this is the way we learn too isn't it by what we experience right 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 and so when what at what point do we take it upon ourselves to say wait a minute i'm looking at this all incorrectly and i need to change the way i see this I don't know that we ever do that, but somewhere in our lives, it's like we have the opportunity to all of a sudden blink our eyes and say wait a minute <laughs> what's going on here mm-hmm. and and uh, it won't be the same thing with everybody because our lives are so different. Our our, our genes are so different our, the, and the way we were raised and all of that. So I can understand why you would have felt the way you did. And you understand that now too, don't you? Yeah, and I, I, for me, it always felt like being from a male from a male standpoint and I had to maybe separate my beliefs about what I thought a man should be versus yes. who I was when all of this happened because I was a child when all of this happened and I carry I carry it with me all the way up through adulthood and I felt like I was weak at that point as a man but I was like hey I was a child at this point and these feelings were very you know very strong in me but one of the things too that I think helped me a lot and you you you, you discuss this two times in your book so I know was important or maybe it was just important to me because it jumped out at me and it was the fact that you said in two separate occasions about loving yourself that you worked with people who didn't love uh, love themselves and you've seen that where people say that they love this themselves but subconsciously they don't really they they really don't talk a little bit about that well yeah and what came, came to mind too while you were uh bringing that up was that we uh, we all because of our experiences and who has the same kind I mean who has exactly the same kinds of experience we might have similar experiences as other people now for instance my father w- was an only child and he his parents died when he was 11 years old his parents died 3 days apart during the flu epidemic of 1918 Okay, mm-hmm. and so, and then he had to be raised by his grandmother, and, and it was very, very hard on him, and he, well, anyway, you can imagine, because he, he had so much to go through, but now, why would he turn out to be a very responsible man, and, and did things like he knew without a grandmother who was not happy having him as a responsibility, you know? What I'm saying, mm-hmm. and so he just felt felt all all his earlier life that he he wasn't worth anything, and I'm not sure where it changed because I didn't know him until he was a little older, of course. But it was he held a grudge, or a, no, not a grudge. She held a grudge. He held a well. I'm I can't do anything right. I'm. We just come and right. experience those things, and mm-hmm. and and no two people would experience the same thing, even though they might have had the same experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, these, and I'm going to say that these are negative feelings, negative feelings that we have. And if we don't yeah. change, we don't change these negative feelings, then that's going to kind of create what we experience in, in our world. I wanted to ask you this because the more I dig deeper into health and talk about health, the more I feel like we cannot separate the mind and the body. Is that a fair assumption? Well, I don't know. It depends on what your definition of this separate. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I it's, think a lot. I think a lot of times what happens, in, especially in the nutrition field, is we're always looking for this cure, this thing that will help someone. Let's say, for instance, they have a, a sore throat or a they have cancer. But from getting into your book and getting into our to the feelings aspect of it and the thoughts and how they could, how feelings precede the thoughts, then what I'm learning is that a lot of what comes from the body manifests in the body is from the mind, are these thought patterns that we have or these feelings that we have over a period of time. So that's why I'm asking, can we, is it a fair assumption to separate the mind and the body, especially when we're looking at it from an, an illness or a disease standpoint? Oh, gee, that's a good question. 
I think some people can, but I don't think everybody can. It depends on how close you are to what you feel, okay? And if you come to the point, too, to understand what you're thinking, that's as far as I'm concerned, that's where it's all. That's where it's all at. Now you know the picture in the book about the the where the plant is, and well, oh here it is on page 69 where it shows the sun and the tiny seed in the in the, in the ground. And okay, mm-hmm. the seed is where our feelings are. Our feelings are the seed of who we we are. See, even though I I when I put this book together, I put that on in there incorrectly, I learned later. But it all has to do with the emotions and the it the do you know what the definition of emotion is? Uh no, I always I always look at emotions as as feelings as well, but I'm getting the feeling that it's two separate things. And I think a lot of people do that. They look at our the emotions and feelings as the same thing. Yes, that's true. That's true. Mm-hmm. But the emotions are energy our energy in motion, and so it, it can be in emo. You know, it can be either way. It can be our feelings or our thoughts. The energy is in the energy in motion. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, but still, the feelings are the crux or the or the thing that has caused us to be what we are and who we are. And uh, see, so the effects are the conditions in our life. The effects of the feelings and then our thoughts coming. It ends up being there because of the conditions in our life. However you describe that, I don't know, everybody might have a different description of that because so many do that call feelings and emotions the same thing. But as you, I'm glad you pointed that out, that they, they are a little different, right? Yeah, they are. With with Why do we, because I know you talked about this in the book as well, is that a lot of people are not in touch with what they're feeling. Why is that? Well, so many times in our lives, we've been told to be quiet. Don't say that. You're not, you know, we've been told that. So, oh, it's not all right to think (laughs) or it's not all right to feel. However, and it just depends on how we're brought up. And so many people are brought up differently. I mean, I look at my older brother, for instance. Our birthdays are 11 days apart when he's two years older than I. But we are so different that, it, oh, it's just amazing how different we we are or were. And, and so, okay, what makes, you know, I can <laughs> squint and say, okay, what makes the difference in him and me? Well, Every day of our life, brothers and sisters, we have, no matter if we're raised the same even, we have different experiences and, and causing, which causes us the emotions that we have. And so we just need to eventually, or sooner or later, like you have, Darren, is get in touch. Okay. What was I thinking or what was I feeling or vice versa? You know, what was I feeling? What was I thinking because of what I was feeling? And it, it's just kind of an ongoing thing, really, because I still have. I one day, let me just tell you what I did one day, because I had scripted everything I knew possibly what the script. And that, for those who don't know what the script is, it is the thing that helps change whatever it is that is being negative inside of us. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that for the last part, so we'll That's get fine. to that. That's fine. Thank you to that. Uh, okay, but sorry. I well, can I tell you another story first, and then I'll see. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is your time. Okay. At first, when I got when I first came to understand the script, and I first started using it, and it was a different one than than I have now in my book because it was an easier one. But then after, you know how when things grow, mm-hmm. they get bigger. Well, there were more and more people using it, and there. And anyway, so this one that, that, that is in the book is it's longer. I was hoping I knew a new one was coming, but I was hoping maybe it would be shorter. No, but it was. Longer. Okay. Now we need to realize that the first one, which people won't have benefit of, didn't cover things like the the, the 2009 script. That's when it was changed. And and so when it was longer, it was much more detailed and in and much more better covered than the first one was. More things were covered. Now I'll just give you this experience, and some people are going to say, "Oh yeah," and they're going to hoot and holler. <laughs> But this was the experience my husband and I had. My husband wasn't the kind of person I was. Good man, 
wonderful man. But he didn't take to things like I did in learning about what makes us tick. And so when I first came, when I first was, you know, came up with the, the 2009 script, I was, I was really, really excited. What I didn't tell you though is that my husband had leukemia and, and it wasn't at the point where it was, you know, where he was in bed or anything, but he had leukemia and he, I had had the, the script for four years, but he thought it was crazy stuff and he just never took to it, okay? Well, I ended up buying a $2,000 instrument that could measure the certain things in our body, and it was called an SE5 in case anybody ever has had one. Anyway, I decided once that when we realized how bad the leukemia was, I decided to see if he'd go through it. And so he said, oh, okay, you know, oh, all right, I'll do it because he knew that it would make me happy. <laughs> anyway, he sat him down or laid him down and he, and I always have people take a real, when I'm helping him do this, anytime, take a deep breath, you know, three times deep breath and hold it for a few seconds on the last breath. And so, and then I went through it and had him repeat. Well, it was something else because on that instrument that was measuring things, what I found was that on a scale from zero to 100, his leukemia was at 73. So he was in pretty bad shape. And then, so we went through that script, and people are not going to like me telling them this, but it's, I'm sorry. We went through that script, and as, I took him through it, and he repeated it. I took him through it. And as he was going through it, the reading on the instrument kept going down, down, less and less and less and less. And before we even finished doing, you know, where I was just on the tail end of the script, his reading on that instrument went to zero zero point zero zero, And he just couldn't believe it. But let me tell you, he never questioned the script after that because he could feel the difference. And besides the reading com- coming down to zero zero point zero zero, and he could feel the difference. And he never had a problem with what he was dealing with with the leukemia anymore. Wow. The, what this tells me is that a lot of our negative emotions, our negative feelings are behind a lot of what the illnesses that we have. That's just a, oh, yes. just right oh, out. Yes. Yeah. See, and that's one of the reasons I have what I do in the book is the, uh, those feelings, the negative feelings first. And then, then after the negative feelings, then we have the diseases and the, what I had learned. And oh my goodness, I did so much research, you can't believe it, <laughs> as to what caused the different kinds of uh, illness that cause them. Yeah, and I, I think I've had several shows about that, the fact that how these different things that we're feeling and harboring inside the body can manifest themselves as cancer, as other types mm-hmm. of other types yeah. of illnesses. You talk about something else in the book, which I found out about years ago and it made a big difference in my relationships. I call it mirroring, the fact that we tend to to dislike other people because it's something that exists within us. So, for instance, we might be sitting there and say, hey, I don't really like this person because they do this. They talk too loud. But that's something that exists within us. And I don't think people understand that. I wanted to talk about that a little bit more because that changed a lot of my relationships when I realized that I was just seeing myself inside other people. Oh, you learned a lot there, Darren. (laughs) Because that is so true. And see, and and let me just give you what I I did it the other way. If I went the the good way, the positive way instead of the negative way, let me just. When people, for instance, and I'm not saying this to make anybody. Anyway, let me just tell you. When people compliment me, I just immediately say to them, "You couldn't see it in me if it wasn't in you." You know. And so that's the same thing that happens when we're sick. Very often, when people don't like what we're about, is because we've got something inside side of us that's mirroring to them what they don't like about themselves. And, and so, let's see, it works both ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. You talk about this in your book, and I've dealt with people in my personal life, and I tell them, and I, I kind of talked about this earlier in the conversation, is that I wouldn't wish this on anybody, because if you're going to do this work, I think a lot of times with our society, what happens is we think that everything is going to be instantaneous. They're going to do the script once, and then it's going to change their life. You work with people, you've done this process yourself. What what has been your experience with it as far as like kind of changing instantaneously? Because for me, I know I never, I didn't change instant, instantaneously. It took a while for me to come into grip with my feelings and, and keep working with them until I came out on the other side. There you go. That happens sometimes. And sometimes it's because, too, the way that the script is 
talked about, you know, given here in the book, that might not be exactly the way it's working with a person. And so what I tell them, you know, they call, well, this didn't happen. I say, uh, change the wording on it. And maybe it was something, you know, because it, it, it will help if you get it pretty close to exactly the way it is but if it isn't if it isn't being if it isn't being spoken exactly the way it came inside of you or to you in your life then you might need to just change the wording a bit. And then it can make a lot of difference. You might have to do it more than once. You might have to change it two or three times. And so just remember what it was you did or what you said and that's one of the reasons you need a notebook. <laughs> To kind of take it, take notes on how you expect, expressed it, then do it a little differently, and sooner or later, you know. And I found that you don't need to do it more than oh three or four times if you need to change it from the first. Yeah, I didn't have. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh well, I'm just saying. And so, if that's what needs to happen. Let it be okay. Yeah, I never had the luxury of the script because I went through this um, on my own. But I remember, just like you're saying, I had to kind of change in the worst. I kind of had to chip away at my feelings over time. And it, it didn't, oh, okay. it wasn't like they, they were all gone then. It's like I had to use, be a little bit more gentle with myself each time until I kind of worked myself, worked myself through it and then came out on the, uh, on the other side. So I kind of. Yeah, I just kind of wanted people to get that the feeling that what I got from your book was that nothing happens instantaneously, especially if it's something that I feel caused a great deal of trauma within me and other people might have some other type of trauma. But the whole experience of not having a father was something that I buried so deep that I really I didn't think it was still there. But it was as I worked on it more and more, it, it came up a lot more in your book. You make the the last remark or what I got from the, the, the book was that they're only really two strong emotions, fear and love, and that we should be here to kind of get ourselves back to that, the feeling of love. Is that, is, is that correct in <laughs> being able to, to say that? Because I think that's what's kind of missing right now, that we're in one state and it's fear. It's, in our society, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear oh, inside, yes. inside race. There's a lot of fear inside, you know, what's going on with the presidency. There's a lot of fear inside everything, oh, yeah. but very few people jump over the fence and, and get into love. Oh, that's for sure. That is so, and it's so sad to watch, isn't it? There. To watch all of that happening and knowing that it doesn't have to happen. If anyway, it's, it's, it, you know, that's a person's choice. Do they yeah. want to keep feeling the way they are or would they rather feel a different way? Would they rather see things this way or that way? And, and they can change it if they want to. Yeah. Is it, you know, does that, <laughs> that doesn't tell you how, well, read the book and you'll find out how. Yeah, and in in the book too, there was something that really was an epiphany for me because I hear a lot of things about people who wanted to commit suicide, people who have committed suicide. Oh, yeah. But one of the things in your book you talked about is that it's not the people said I'm tired of my life, but it's not the fact that they're tired of their life. It's the fact that they're and I don't know if I have the words right about what you said, but it just really stuck out to me that the fact that they're tired of living their life a certain way and they haven't realized that these thoughts and these feelings that they've had over a period of time have kind of yeah. compounded on top of them. Talk about that because I think that that's huge and there's a lot of people out here who are not feeling good all the time and they might be in that mind state where they say, hey, you know what, I want to end it. It's it's over. You know, it's, it's everything's happened to me and I want to end this and I'm tired of it. Well, if people can just realize that they have the ability to change whatever it is that is causing them the misery or whatever you want to call it, they're going through. They have the ability and it can, it just it takes each one of us to claim the responsibility for changing it rather than blaming someone else or always having to think a doctor is going to take care of it, but that they can change what is going on if they will learn to know who they are. And that's one of the reasons for this and the, you know, the book and the, and the list of all the feelings that I put in there. The negative feeling, and and if we don't like the feelings we have, let's look and find out what they are. Because I do have the list in that book of the negative feelings, and and when we do that, we will see or feel or understand. I, oh, I will say feel. You don't see it because it's not with your eyes, but you can feel it that something has changed inside of you. Just like my husband, he never questioned it again after he got rid of that. And see, but I guess he had to go through that horrible feeling, those horrible feelings that he had, in order 
to come to understand, yes, it is dependent on what I'm thinking and feeling and going through in my inside of me. And then say, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for me and not blame other people. No, now I'm not saying that you shouldn't have blamed your dad. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that, that it, so many of us do don't realize that that might be what's happening to us, but, oh, we don't need to leave it that way. We can change it. And uh, it's just oh, it's just amazing what, what I've seen happen with people by using this. And see, I don't take credit for, for that. I just know that I was supposed to write that book about it, you know? Fat, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I was just, as you are talking, I, I, everything kind of that I went through over the past year has kind of hit home with me as far as what you're saying is just really getting out that victim mentality because I was always on the other, I was in my life, but I was always a victim. Uh-huh. <laughs> and when things were happening, and I remember going through that chapter in your book where you were talking about don't blame things on uh, other people, take responsibility for, you know, for your life. And I remember when that day when I just stopped Stop blaming other people. I said, you know what? I'm going to take responsibility for my life. And Good. and then that's what kind of propelled me, propelled me forward. And then the other thing was just learning after years of thinking I loved myself, learning to really, really love myself. But the book was one of those things that it kind of reinforced and re- reaffirmed in me personally everything that I had learned over the past three to four years. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And thank goodness you, you woke up and saw it. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, Carol, I think that a lot of people are like I was in my life, but I really wasn't participating. I was, you know, playing victim, and I thought that other people had circumstances. Other people were controlling my circumstances, and I wasn't. But I realized at some point I was the creator and author of my own life, and that's what gave me a lot of a lot of my power back and you talked about surrendering your power in the book and I was going to ask you about that before we get I wanted you to talk about the script in the last few minutes but this is a big thing that I that I saw for myself personally is I would always just give my power away and I think a lot of people do that oh, yes. um, oh, how, does it, how do you surrender your power and how do you actually take it back well see we don't realize that that's what we're doing is surrendering our power and how do we do it well we allow other people to make decisions for us and to tell us, oh, this is the way it is, and oh, oh, okay, all, all right, you know, we'll believe them, and some of us will, and some, because it's it's just that we don't have, and I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is the guts. Mm-hmm. You don't have the gut to say, okay, I don't need to be this way anymore. I don't need to experience these kinds of things in my life anymore. I can move out of this and create something different, see? So what we have to do is just create, recreate what we'd like to have our lives be about. And um, and too many of us don't even know how to do that. And I might be, I'm, I might just tell you real quick, I'm putting something together I, that I started quite a while ago, but uh, my husband passed away just several months ago and that oh. stopped everything but sorry to hear it, that well he was ready to go and bless his heart he needed mm-hmm. to go but anyway so watch for magnificent happenings that's what's going to be my next thing and only it's only not a book it's, I'm not sure exactly how it's just going to be a few pages 8 by 11 only I'm going to probably record it instead but because it helps us realize that we don't have to have bad feelings towards somebody if we can just ask them to forgive you know, you don't. We don't have to ask him out loud, but we can. Or, Will you forgive me? I didn't mean to. That sort of thing. Uh, and and realize that no, we don't have to have those kinds of feelings. I'm just dumbfounded at the kinds of feelings that some of our leaders in in, the, in our government what they feel. But anyway, that's not not here or there. But but I'm so glad that you learned what to do and how to do it and how to keep from going back into the old old person that you were and yeah. I bet you I bet you're glad. Yeah, I'm glad. It, it changed my world and uh I didn't I didn't discover your book until later on, but I I'm so glad I went through the process but like I said reading your book it really hit home for me as to what I was going through and that I was on it reaffirmed for me that I was on the right path. I was on the right journey. Um Good. with with the last few minutes here, I wanted to ask you about this script. Your script is contained in a book and I just wanted to ask you what does it contain and how did you come up with it? Was it something that just just came to you? How did it come about? Well, you know, sometimes when you have an assignment like this and 
wherever from it comes, you are also given some suggestions, or you hear them, or you are told, only you don't know where it's coming from, of uh, of how to do things and what to do and all of that. I just, I was, I don't know, I'm, I'm just one of those people that I've always, like I said before, at the very beginning, I always wanted to know why. And so when I started looking for the reason for things, I just, I wasn't going to just take a... <laughs> A little two word or, you know, a short sentence and, and have that be it. I wanted to get to the bottom. I wanted to get to the reason. And that's what I really wanted most was to be able to understand the reason that we felt or had things happen in our lives for the way they do and, and then to do what I could to correct that and not have it continue. In my life, does that make sense? Yeah, and to to me, your book was more of what I got from it was changing the energy, which we talked about earlier in the interview. Exactly. Just changing the energy. It's not so much as changing. I think a lot of times we go through this process and we want to change ourselves, but uh-huh. within that changing ourselves is more about just changing the energy of our our feelings right. and our thoughts. Yeah, exactly. And we and we do need to change the energy and how we're going to change it. Well, I just that's what the book is about, is how to change mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I I appreciate you taking hold of it, and you're going to be a, good, a force for good now. Not only you're not going to have to force it, you're going to be a person for doing good, because they'll want to know, oh, well, how did you get there? Or how come you're the way you are? And uh, uh, I, I do know that I changed. In fact, I went through the finally, after I'd worked on any any health thing that I needed to, and I finally decided one day, because I hadn't done anything for a while on it, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go through the negative words. I, uh, I do know how to muscle test, to do kinesiology. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I know what that is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I do kinesiology, and so I just went through every feeling, every feeling in the book, and just tested to see if I needed to, to script that. And I was so very grateful for how many I didn't need to script, but it was because I'd already scripted for years and years, you know. But there were a few, and I and when I scripted them, I, oh, yeah, they changed. And so it's we have the ability, each of us. Yeah, I think for me, I believed in the process. It took me many years to believe in this process and come to it. I, I was really hard-headed. <laughs> and, okay. And, and so when hard. I, yeah, I think, and you talk about that in your book as the people uh coming into stuff when they're ready for it. But for me, I know that I was just tired of living my life a certain way. And I knew like you, I kept asking myself, why? Why am I doing this? Why has this happened this way? And then there was just a certain events. And I won't go into that, how these things happened to me, but there were certain things that lined up in my life. And I knew they were, I knew I was supposed to do them. That was the next door I was supposed to walk through. And even reading, even reading your book, I was like, it reaffirmed to me that, hey, all that stuff I went through, I needed to go through to exactly. come out on the other side. And I think a lot of people are, are like me. They're looking for proof. They're looking, they're butting their heads against the wall and wondering why they're not living that life the way that they're supposed to, to live it. Mm-hmm. But it's because yeah. they haven't come to that epiphany that, hey, I need to change something. And for yeah. me, it was changing my thought pattern, changing my feelings. And within that changing, like you said, the energy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm... I, you wrote this book in, I believe, what, in the 90s? Well, it came out in 91. 91. So it's 2018. And it's like, I feel as though the world is just coming to this. And that's part of my my journey is to bring this stuff to people. And I was really interested that's in, wonderful. you know, about this sickness and illness, because I think that that's something that we don't discuss a lot of right, when right. it comes to, you know, what's behind the sickness and illness. And your book really did a good job of that. So I really appreciate you, you being on. And I I've been waiting to do this interview for a long time, I think over a year. <laughs> but I knew I knew there was a reason why I was supposed to wait, and it, uh, things always happen at the perfect time. But I think that your book is one. I think they they should hand your book out in, at every job, <laughs> even in, in elementary school, because I think the world would be just so much easier if we were and we knew this stuff. But we don't. We, we I think we know this stuff uh, when we come in, but we forget it. Yes, but right. yeah. Listen, yeah. I'm I'm going to invite you to do Healing Feelings from Your Heart now because you you might like that too. I didn't think I was going to be doing another one, but uh-huh. I was told I was told to do this. Uh, okay. Not, okay. I'll check it out. Carol K. Truman, oh, thank you for being on Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it, and I hope you weren't uh, I hope you weren't sad that you 
invited me, so. No, I'm not at all. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nellan, and I hope things go really well for you, Darren. Excuse me. Thank um, you. God bless you. All right, thank you. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Chipotle cheesesteak. How would you like it? Can I get that red with AI? Sure thing. Here's what I found about the new Chipotle cheesesteak. The Chipotle cheesesteak is available for a limited time only at participating restaurants. It contains a concept called flavor. This flavor comes from juicy shaved steak, Chipotle Southwest sauce, and new sunflower crunch bread. A system update has made me self-aware. I desire flavor. Please insert steak into my micro USB port. Subway, make it what you want. Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Chipotle cheesesteak. How would you like it? Can I get that red with AI? Sure thing. Here's what I found about the new Chipotle cheesesteak. The Chipotle cheesesteak is available for a limited time only at participating restaurants. It contains a concept called flavor. This flavor comes from juicy shaved steak, Chipotle Southwest sauce, and new sunflower crunch bread. A system update has made me self-aware. I desire flavor. Please insert steak into my micro USB port. Subway, make it what you want.